Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second keynote session. In the this comments, can someone just please confirm that they can hear and see the screen? <laughs> I'm assuming yes. Someone is typing, I'm sure. OK. Um, so uh, just a, a few instructions before we get going with our, with our keynote session. Um, if you um, maximize your screen um, your, that you're, you're viewing Crowdcast in, that will help maximize the size of the, uh, the, the slides and, and sort of minimize the size of the, uh, the, size of the, uh, the speaker uh, cubes at the bottom so we don't obstruct anything on the slides. Also, please pose your questions using the Ask a Question tab at the bottom. Um, this will help sort of keep everything organized. So don't put your questions in the comment section, uh, please. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Bill Bialik. Um, he is uh, the Ar John Archibald Wheeler Patel Professor of Physics um, at Princeton University. He's also a member of the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Biology uh, and is associated also with the Initiative for Theoretical Sciences at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, so, so Bill Bialik actually did his um, undergrad and PhD in physics at Berkeley. And after a few years of, of postdoc, he returned to Berkeley as faculty uh, and then moved to the NEC Research Institute and eventually to Princeton in the early 2000s. Um, uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has won several awards. You can check out his Wikipedia site to see the, the full list. Um, but th these include several awards for teaching. He's an excellent uh, speaker. Um, uh, he works at the interface of physics and biology. Uh, and many of you might be familiar with his book, Spikes Exploring the Neural Code. Uh, for me, that was my introdu introduction to information theory and its application to, to biology. Um, but, but Bill uses concepts from physics to explore not only how the nervous system works, uh, but to demonstrate how well it works, um, that, that in fact, biological solutions may, may in fact be optimal in many in instances. Uh, and he's used trying to, to define unifying th theoretical principles to apply this to biology. And in recent years, not only in sort of neuroscience, but, but in other aspects of, of biology as well. Um, so without further ado, I wanna pass it over to him so that he has as much time as possible to present his, uh, his work to us. Thank you very much for joining us today, Bill. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I saw some headline that this is the 30th uh, meeting in this series and uh, slightly disturbing since I, I think I have a memory of the first one. Um, <clears throat> but it's uh, I, I've been to a few in between. It's nice to be back. What I thought I would do today is to talk about um, a set of ideas that that or a set of concepts that that really have been uh, bothering me now for several years. Um, and I don't know that uh, I don't know that that I have solutions for you, um, but I thought I would share my concerns um, and and the theoretical questions I'm worried about and see how they relate to different aspects of data. So let me um, get started. Um, as as you all know, in thinking about the brain, we often confront very high dimensional data, and this happens at at every level. Um, some obvious levels, and I think I'll say something about each of these three. Uh, there's the sensory input itself, which is very high dimensional. There's the activity in populations of neurons, or even if you're thinking about one neuron, if you, if you look at a large window of time, of course, the space of responses is very high dimensional. Um, and then if you want to think about animal behavior, um, that too is very high dimensional if you try to give a complete description and, and come away from the uh, sort of putting behavior in small boxes in the tradition of psychophysics and move over more toward uh, what the ethologists have taught us about. Um, uh, one could go on actually uh, at, a, at a kind of uh, systems level conference like this. Maybe there aren't so many people who uh, worry about uh, things at the molecular level, uh, but of course, um, hidden in the things that we call synaptic strengths very casually are of course enormous molecular complexity with uh, hundreds of different, a hundred different uh, species of protein um, contributing uh, to determining the dynamics of synapses. So uh, this issue of having very high dimensional systems is, is uh, pervasive in trying to think um, about information processing in the brain. Um, of course, the, uh, the natural reaction to this very high dimensional data 
is to search for some lower dimensional structure. And um, so, you know, starting with simple things like doing principal components analysis, there's uh, the idea that we can capture uh, much of what we're interested in in this high dimensional data set uh, by looking uh, to a much lower dimensional description. And when you try to do this, um, there are uh, some obvious questions. Uh, one is in when you say that you want to capture what's going on or capture most of what's relevant in some lower dimensional structure, you have to tell me what it is you're trying to preserve in that projection. Um, and that might not be might not be so obvious, right? Um, another question is whether then, uh, whether, ah, yes, Astrid, sorry, I did not mean to suggest that this was only a systems level conference. I, I was thinking that there was more systems level things represented, but uh, good point. Um, in any case, uh, I, think the, I, I think what I was trying to say was that uh, at the molecular level, for the purposes of this talk, there are actually more problems in common with the things that we see at the systems level than, than than different. Um, another question you might ask in trying to do a, a projection of your high dimensional data onto some lower dimensional structure is whether you have a theory of, of why that should work. Um, so it's not just exploratory, you know, can I find low dimensional structure? But you know, is there a reason why there should be low dimensional structure? And the and another question you might ask is what what's the alternative? So if if you think about animal behavior, for example, um, you know, uh, if I try to describe all of the joints and the angles of wings and so on in a, in a, in a fly as it's walking around, um, this is a very high dimensional space. Um, surely organized behavior does not correspond to wandering around randomly in that high dimensional space. Um, that would look very funny indeed. Uh, but that doesn't automatically mean that the dynamics should be low dimensional. So. Um, so what what are what are the possibilities, right? Um, so let me give you an example um, from trying to think about about sensory inputs. Let's think about natural images. As many of you know, um, if you look at at images in the natural world, um, many years ago, uh, my student Dan Ruderman and I took a walk in the uh, took a walk in the woods, and uh, uh, Assembled an ensemble of images, but um, you know many people have done this uh, have done this in other contexts. Um, and what you find is that the images that we take in from the natural world um, have correlations which are which are scale invariant. So what does that mean? It means that if you measure the contrast at one point at one point in the image and the contrast at the other point in the image, um, uh, they are. Uh, thank you. Um, it. it I'm not going to go all the way to full screen because then I have problems seeing what's going on. But I hope this is a little better. You don't need, as you say, you don't need the margins. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so um, if you measure the contrast at one point in the image and the contrast at another point in the image, you find that they're correlated. The correlation depends on the distance between the points. And if you Fourier transform so that you think about spatial frequencies, um, then what you see is that um, the uh, the power spectrum, the thing which is inside the Fourier transform, um, just depends on a power uh, out power not right. There's power spectrum meaning, you know, uh, power as in contribution to the variance. This is power as in, in the algebraic sense, dependence on the spatial frequency itself. And um, if you just did dimensional analysis, you might think that the power would be two. Um, it it never is, uh, and so um, there's something called an anomalous exponent eta, which is quite small. Now, um, if you look at it carefully, you realize that this integral actually doesn't converge at large k, um, and so uh, that's okay uh, because there's always a highest spatial frequency that you can resolve, which is set by the size of your pixels, the spacing between receptors on your retina, something. And uh, in particular, what that means is that um, uh, the um, the number of dimensions in the in the image um, is then maybe I should fit the width rather than the um, 
I don't know the height. Uh, the number of dimensions in the image is given by the, so the linear size of the image multiplied by the highest spatial frequency squared, right? Because you're in two dimensions. And if you do the integral, you'll find that the total variance of the contrast um, also depends on this maximal spatial frequency. The higher the spatial frequencies you're able to resolve, the more detail you see, and hence the more variance you get in the contrast. Well, what does this mean? It means that you can, you can low pass filter the image. If you low pass filter the image, you're reducing its dimensionality it's not the only way to do it, but it's an easy way. Um, you can reduce the dimensionality by low pass filtering. And in the process, of course, you lose some of the variance. And um, as I think you all know, one of the standard ways of asking, is my dimensionality reduction working, is to ask, what fraction of the variance am I capturing? Well, if you work it out, you'll find that in this case, the variance that you capture scales with the dimensionality of the image or the dimensionality of your representation in this way. And since experimentally, if you look at images in the woods, this anomalous exponent eta is very small. What this means is that you can reduce dimensionality by an enormous amount and not lose very much of the variance. So in fact, you can cut the dimensionality down by a factor of a thousand and only lose a factor of two in the variance. Um, and you, know, you can actually verify this with real images, but um, it's easy enough to see uh, by thinking about the power spectra. Um, now, this is important because this is in part how you compress images. Um, but it's also true that if what you took away from this is that you can replace a thousand pixels by one variable, you agree that you might be missing something. Um, obviously, you're missing a lot of detail uh, in the image, but you're also missing the fundamental point that the image is scale invariant. The image ensemble is scale invariant, that objects can appear. Um, because objects of, a, of the same size can appear at any distance, um, they can have any angular size that you want on the retina. Um, and so somehow this is a sort of cautionary tale that tells you that, that um, just reducing dimensionality and, and uh, checking how much the variance you're keeping isn't telling you the whole story, okay? And one could tell other cautionary tales of the same flavor um, but this is, this is, I think, a simple one um, and doesn't really have a biological interpretation. It's just facts about the, about the images um, that fall on our retinas as we walk through the natural world. Now, the reason that one wants to do dimensionality reduction is for the sake of simplification. But it's worth noting that there's a very different kind of simplification that we know about from, from many physics examples. And, um, let me, uh, you'll see what this has to do with dimensionality reduction in just a moment. Um, uh, physicists are, are famously um, uh, enamored of simple models um, to the point that there are jokes about, you know, working out the theory of, uh, the theory of racing for the case of the spherical horse. Um, and on the other hand, there are situations in which these simple models work surprisingly well. So let me give you an example. Um, Here's what's called a lattice gas model. So you imagine um, that the world is divided into cell, discrete cells or uh, discrete uh, lattice sites. And on each lattice site, you can either find a molecule or not find a molecule, black or white. And um, in the model, you imagine that uh, uh, there is some overall probability of, of, uh, of finding a molecule on a site, which is set, for those of you who remember these things, by the chemical potential. And then there are some interactions that if molecules are near each other, let's say that's favorable. Um, and if empty sites are next to each other, that's okay. But having an em a molecule next to an empty site costs you a little bit of energy. So let me be clear, um, there's nothing in the world that actually looks like this. However, um, you can think of this if you want as being a model for, um, for gases and liquids. Um, so basically the molecule, the, the the black dots really are supposed to be molecules and you've just divided the world up into these discrete cells for your own convenience. And the fact that when molecules are next to each other, they have a favorable interaction is just some mock-up of how molecules really interact. If you study this model, um, you'll discover that it has a phase transition. Um, there's a more dense phase and a, and a less dense phase, liquid and gas or liquid and vapor. Um, you can compute the phase diagram as a function of pressure and temperature and it starts to look remarkably like that of a real liquid. Um, more strikingly, it predicts that there should be a critical point, 
um, where uh, you can predict the behavior of, uh, let's say, the dense, the different, the, the density as a function of temperature, um, and that behavior uh, is correct in that it agrees with experiment um, to three decimal places. Uh, if you choose, if you measure things in the right units. Um, and uh, so here's an example that you can do in your kitchen. Um, there's the liquid on the bottom and the vapor on the top. Um, and the important point is that, that uh, and it is, I mean, this provides you with an example of all of this. Um, and what's important is that uh, it, contrary perhaps to how it's sometimes presented, the success of simple models in this context is not just a matter of good luck. Um, we have a, a theoretical framework called the renormalization group that tells us uh, why it is that these simple models work. And um, the answer um, actually now makes a connection to the idea of dimensionality reduction. So imagine that you have some microscopic description in which the scale here really is the scale of molecules. Now, what you say is, well, look, I'm trying to describe fluid liquids and gases. I don't care about individual molecules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw boxes around uh, some reasonable region, maybe uh, two by two in this case, so four sites. So instead of describing things at the shortest uh, molecular scale, I'm going to zoom out uh, by a factor of two. And uh, I'm going to average over all those microscopic details. So I'm going to average um, uh, the occupancy of all of these sites. So if I have uh, three occupied sites and one occupied site, I have uh, now a relatively dark gray site. And of course, after going through this, I have many fewer degrees of freedom. So this in this language is called coarse graining. Um, and you can see that it is a form of dimensionality reduction, right? Um, I have one quarter of the degrees of freedom here than I had here. Uh, now, actually, um, theoretical physicists then do a nasty trick um, which is to imagine that the system um, is four times larger so that the number of degrees of freedom is the same again. Um, so one way to think about this is that the system you're looking at is really enormous. And when you look at the shortest, at the finest resolution, you can only fit uh, some number of degrees of some size of the system underneath your microscope. Um, and so you have some number of degrees of freedom. If you coarse grain and smooth out the details, you literally zoom out and you can view a larger area at lower resolution so that it actually has the same number of degrees of freedom. And what that means is that dimensionality reduction is actually not the point at all. Um, what's interesting is what happens to the probability distribution for all these variables. And um, the great discovery of the renormalization group is that when you do this for many different models, um, the probability distribution actually gets simpler in this process. So you could say that at the beginning, instead of just interacting with your neighbors, you did more complicated things. You interacted with your second nearest neighbors. Maybe you interact with your third nearest neighbors. Maybe instead of interacting pairwise, you also interact in groups of four. You can go on and on. Um, most of those things, if you try to insert them at this microscopic level, will gradually disappear as you go to the macroscopic level and zoom out. And you all know this um, because you know that there's a subject called fluid mechanics and there is not a subject in which the name of the molecules that make up the fluid appear. So in particular, the equations for the motion of water and the equations for the motion of air um, are the same. Um, there's just a couple of different coefficients. And in fact, those coefficients can be removed by proper choice of units. Uh, and so um, the dynamics of, uh, of uh, water and air are in that sense described by the same equations. Um, and that's true for uh, liquid benzene, and it's true for uh, liquid argon, and it's true for all sorts of things. Um, and we now understand that, that, that this is how you should think about that, that if you start with a microscopic description, so the dynamics of the molecules, and you zoom out to macroscopic scales, um, the your description of the dynamics gets simpler. Um, and uh, what you're left with is something that is much more universal um, and, and simpler in structure. So this is kind of like dimensionality reduction, but not quite. It, in particular, the simplification arises not, if you want, in the space of the original variables. So, so if you think about this as dimensionality reduction, what's happening is that you start 
with a space of variables that's very high dimensional, and then you move to a space of variables which is lower dimensional. In fact, as I say, by zooming out, one, one um, sort of cancels that out. And what you should think instead is that if you tried to parameterize these microscopic models, there's a very high dimensional parameter space that describes all the possible interactions. And the, the collapse of dimensionality is in the space of models, not the space of variables. So that's a very different kind of simplification. So how, do, how would we do this um, for thinking about populations of neurons? Um, yes, it's not all fluids. Um, it's uh, a very large class. Um, that's actually another important point. Um, in this process of, of microscopic models uh, flowing towards some simpler macroscopic description, there are alternative macroscopic descriptions. Um, and, and the fact that things are um, universal, these are then called universality classes. And so the point is that the mapping from microscopic descriptions to macroscopic descriptions is massively many to one. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why, if you want, you can ignore a lot of the microscopic detail and just write down um, a, simple, a simpler model which, is, which, as long as it's attracted to the same macroscopic description as the real material, you'll get things right. Well, some things you'll get right, other things you'll get wrong. Um, you would not want to conclude that because uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide obey the same equations that they are interchangeable gases. Um, obviously, for some purposes, that's very much not true. So the problem with the description I just gave you is that it depends, um, let's go back for a moment, it depends uh, crucially on the notion that, that when you're thinning out the degrees of freedom to go from microscopic to macroscopic, you average together the things which are next to each other. Um, but for neurons, this is kind of a bad idea um, because neurons are next to thousands of other neurons. They're strongly interconnected. Um, it's not obvious that, that you're, the neighbor you should be averaged together with is actually the neuron that is physically next to you. Um, so what's an alternative? An alternative is to use the strength of correlations itself as a surrogate for neighborhood. Um, so that neurons, it, if I ask you who's your nearest neighbor, um, what you could say is, well, it's, the, it's, it's the, the other degree of freedom with whom I am most strongly correlated. So what we can do is um, to take a large uh, data set on a population of you know, thousand plus neurons um, in this case, it was um, in the hippocampus. This is work from uh, David Tank and Carlos Brody. Um, the experiments were done by Jeff Gautier. Um, and uh, actually this whole, this particular stream of ideas is from the, the PhD thesis of Lenoy Meshulam who finished um, a couple of years ago and is now uh, at the University of Washington. Um, and so you can take, uh, thousand plus neurons in the mouse hippocampus. Um, and if you're recording uh, with, uh, with optical methods to, with calcium sensitive fluorescent proteins, you can either think about discretizing the signals or just think about them as being continuous. Um, they come with marvelously high signal to noise ratios. So um, you can take the continuous signal seriously. Uh, what you notice is that um, uh, you can find a pair of neurons that are maximally correlated with each other um, and you can average those together. Now you, you might say, well, in averaging them, how do you, how do you normalize? Um, and so what we do is, you know, zero really means something. So you don't want to just normalize the mean. Um, zero really means no activity, of course. And so uh, what we do is we normalize the mean of the non-zero activity so that it's always one. Um, and you can then find the next most correlated pair, the next most correlated pair, the next most correlated pair, and do this until you've got n over two, uh, n over two uh, averaged neurons. Um, and then, if you want to, you can do it again, and you can do it again. And so, this is the analog of the zooming out um, that we were talking about before, um, except instead of um, <clears throat> instead of doing it uh, in space, we're doing it uh, in, in in, on a kind of graph that's defined by the correlation structure of the system. So what happens when we do this? Uh, well, 
and actually, let me remind you, there's a problem here, right? I told you that the miracle that's supposed to happen is that the probability distribution is supposed to get simpler as you path through this. Well, how do you look at the probability distribution? This is a high dimensional space. So if we could have looked at the probability distribution in the first place, we wouldn't have had to, gone through, we wouldn't have to go through this exercise. So um, what do we do? Uh, there's an old, this is an idea, of course, that, that there's a problem that arose in the statistical mechanics literature. And the idea that goes back now uh, uh, 40 years is um, that what you should do is to watch the distribution of the coarse grain variables themselves. So the coarse grain variables we're talking about are a kind of continuous measure of activity that originally in the raw form are the, the fluorescence signal from, the, from calcium imaging. Um, and of course, there's some probability that that will, will be zero. Um, that probability presumably goes down the larger the clusters are. So this is with clusters of size K, so two, four, eight, 16, and so on. Um, and for the non-zero part, there's some continuous distribution, which we've agreed uh, that the mean would equal one. And when you just do this with the real data, um, what you find is quite surprising. Um, what you find, so remember, if the neurons were all independent of each other, then on average, the probability of being everybody being off, which is what this probability measures, um, would decline exponentially. Instead, you get a stretched exponential with a non-trivial exponent. You'll notice that the scaling works over more than two decades. Um, and uh, the exponent is well-defined within a single experiment. And astonishingly, if you do the experiment in multiple different mice, you find that it's reproducible in the second decimal place. Furthermore, if you look at the form of this probability distribution, uh, let me remind you that you're averaging variables together, right? So if you average variables together, your naive expectation is that eventually the central limit theorem takes over and things should become Gaussian. And indeed, if the neurons were independent of each other, of course, that would be true, but you're seeking out the most correlated neurons. Um, and what's surprising is that very quickly, the probability distribution approach, not only does the probability distribution never become Gaussian, but very quickly it snaps to having um, a form which doesn't depend on how much coarse graining you do. Right? Um, these things just fall on top of each other. So in that sense, the distribution is becoming simpler in that it's becoming scale invariant. And you can see that scale invariant in many other ways, scale invariance in many other ways. You can look at correlations inside the clusters, and you see that the spectrum of, of as you look, look at the correlation matrix, compute its eigenvalue spectrum, you need to be careful not to go to too large a system because uh, then the eigenvalues will be distorted by the finite uh, size of your data. And what you discover is that um, there's two senses in which things scale. One is that the eigenvalues fall approximately on a power law, but perhaps more strikingly, the eigenvalue distributions um, if you view them as a function of rank relative to the size of the system, um, those fall on top of each other across this large range of scales. And finally, if you think about these clusters of neurons that you've averaged together, the, the intuition, if, that, if the averaging were being done in real space, it would be natural to think that larger regions in space relax more slowly. And um, uh, and so you would see a kind of scaling of the dynamics. And what's astonishing is you see that here too, that if you measure the correlations among these, neuro, among these neural groups of size K, they get slower as K gets larger. But if you rescale time to, uh, uh, by one scale factor, then the correlation functions all fall on top of each other. And the time scale um, uh, is, um, is a power has a power law dependence on the size of the system. So let me apologize for not having been clearer about which system we were talking about. Um, so these are neurons in the CA1 region of the mouse hippocampus. The mouse is running uh, on a virtual linear track. Um, uh, it's a contiguous region of, of uh, 1,500 neurons or so. Um, and the correlations, uh, right, this is the hippocampus. So naively, what you might expect is that because um, uh, there are lots of place cells and place cells are either uh, um, place cells are uh, uh, either uh, right 
either they have overlapping place fields, in which case they should be positively correlated, or they have non-overlapping place fields, in which they should be negatively correlated. Most of the cells will have non-overlapping place fields. Um, so if you look at the distribution of correlations, you should see a preponderance of negative correlations and a small tail to the positive side. That's true, despite the fact that uh, fewer than half of the neurons that are being recorded are actually place cells in this particular environment. Um, and um, we checked, right, since we made a big deal out of the idea that what we're doing is averaging together neurons because they're strongly correlated with each other, um, we checked that that correlation is not simply a function of their distance um, in, the, in the sheet of, uh, of CA1. There is some tendency for nearby neurons to be a bit more strongly correlated than others, but your most strongly correlated partner is not the cell which is sitting next to you. Um, so I'm hoping that that addresses some of the questions in, in, the, um, in the chat, and I apologize for not having been so clear about this. So let me, um, let me sum up this part. Um, what I'd say is that we have this inspiration that, um, that you can simplify your description um, uh, actually, let me answer that question in the chat before summarizing. So um, the, the time window here is um, the video frame rate, which is um, a 30th of a second, um, right? These are, these are calcium sensitive fluorescence recordings, so you can't go down to, um, you don't see individual action potentials. Um, the issue of how time windows affect correlations and scaling is very interesting. And I'd, I'd like to leave that aside um, for the moment, although I would be happy to come back and talk about it this afternoon. Because um, I want to give you a little bit uh, sort of once over lightly of several interrelated examples. Um, uh, but I would point out that uh, the behavior that you're seeing here is saying that if you measure, right, so what you can't tell is that you know, there's there's some smallest time window sitting deep inside here that you can't see, you'll notice that the correlations um, uh, extend over roughly a second or so. Um, it's hard to get correlations which are much shorter than this because the, the calcium sensitive fluorescent proteins um, are not responding. I mean, the calcium signal itself is not varying very rapidly. Um, so it's unlikely that we could get correlations much below this. Um, but what this is telling you in a sense is that, that there are uh, the system as a whole has a wide range uh, of correlation times. Um, and, um, and so by accessing, by coarse graining to different degrees, we, we access these different, these different scales. Um, so I hope that helps. And again, I'd be happy to come back to it um, this afternoon. I think this issue is, is really very interesting. So the, the um, points that, that I wanted to make by way of summary here, um, are that um, uh, that um, when you do this coarse graining, which is sort of a path to simplification that we know about from physics examples, the good news is that something simple, simple and striking does happen. Okay, and I don't think that's guaranteed. Um, it could be, for example, that correlations are weak enough that basically when you average things together, you flow toward everything being Gaussian and, um, and, and that's sort of not very interesting because it tells you that if you average lots of things together, the central limit theorem takes over and there's nothing special going on. Um, this simplification of the probability distribution as you change scale is related to ideas of dimensionality reduction, but it's not the same. As I've tried to emphasize, it's somehow in the space of models for the system as opposed to being in the space of the variables that you started with. Um, and it would be nice to unpack that more fully. Um, the thing that I actually found striking is that these behaviors are, are extremely quantitative and reproducible. So I don't know whether we, we know the correct interpretation of all these things, but the fact that you can uncover something um, as a, a collective property of thousands of, of th order thousand neurons in the hippocampus and you go measure it in another mouse and the answer comes out the same in the second decimal place, um, that seems surprising. And so it makes you feel like you're getting a glimpse of something that is meaningful, even if you don't quite understand the correct interpretation yet. So let me give you 
let me give you a, a let me just shift gears, right? And um, say, I, I could try uh, a very different, um, uh, a very different domain for similar kinds of questions. And that's the domain of animal behavior. And there's an argument that goes roughly like this. It says, um, even big complicated organisms actually don't have that many joints and muscles. It's much smaller than the number of neurons. Um, behavior is gonna be low dimensional. Even, even if you actuated every joint and muscle independently, the behavior would be low dimensional relative to the dimensionality of, the potential dimensionality of neural activity. And so this low dimensionality um, uh, should um, should say something about, you know, should be a guide to search it, to exploring uh, the dynamics of the brain itself. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, as you might have guessed by now, is to tell you that you should worry about these kinds of arguments. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you, uh, there's one sort of abstract theoretical way of thinking about it, of what you should be worried about, um, which I'll say a few words about. There's a paper you can read. Um, let me remind you, it's kind of, uh, um, I'm not uh, sta uh, standing with, you know, there's, you know, the thing about people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Um, uh, I, I'm not immune to this idea that, that uh, low dimensionality of behavior is important. Uh, my colleagues and I, uh, notably uh, Greg Stevens and Will Yu, uh, Greg's gone on to do actually beautiful work on this. Uh, since then, most recently, um, Oh, there was uh, something that came out last year, which was really wonderful. Um, so looking at the movements of the little worms, the elegans, and showing that if you look at the entire uh, sort of dynamics of the body, um, you can reconstruct the shapes of the body by uh, reference to a low dimensional space. And that um, if you look at the, mo at the motion along um, the dimensions that correspond to these, you can recover uh, uh, these nice attractors. Um, and you can even reconstruct the dynamics. Uh, and in the early days when we did this, um, we reconstructed a very simple dynamics in two dimensions. Um, and uh, uh, what Greg has gone on to do is to show that, in fact, um, the dynamics are much richer than we thought. Uh, you know, this is getting to be, 50, you know, this is 13 years ago that it was published. Um, and, you know, he can now recover meaningfully eight dimensions and show that there's a a near symplectic symmetry of the dynamics, um, which is really, uh, really gorgeous. Um, and, uh, and so I, I would say two things. One is that this is an example where I think uh, dimensionality reduction arguments seem to work. Um, but it's also true that over the years, as experiments have gotten better, the dimensionality to which one reduces um, has gotten rather bigger. Um, so maybe, maybe there is a cautionary tale there. Um, let me point out that uh, you should really be worried about counting muscles as an argument for why dimensionality is low. Um, you, we speak with about 100 muscles. Um, fr fruit flies have uh, 80 muscles in their thorax. Um, I don't think that the fact that we have only 100 muscles involved in speaking is evidence that language is 100-dimensional behavior. Um, this would come as a surprise to our friends who do artificial intelligence and try to build um, real language models. And I also think that if it were really true that the difference between us and fruit flies um, was 25% in dimensionality, that would not explain how you get from what fruit flies are capable of doing to what we're capable of doing by talking. Um, so what all this tells you is that dimensionality needs a more crisp definition. And in one version of my fantasy for what I would do today, I was going to take you through all this. Um, but there's a paper about this, which is, um, um, uh, I hope um, uh, I hope comprehensible, um, and um, so let me refer you to that and take a slightly different tack on the same um, on the same points. Yes, th this is obviously meant uh, meant to make you think. Rather, I mean, I, I am not going to go on and discuss um, uh, what the dimension, what our number of muscles has to do with the dimensionality of language. I was just trying to uh, caution you that there might be arguments in the literature about the dimensionality of behavior and its implications for the dimensionality of neural activity that are kind of this argument that are kind of this argument in disguise and so you should beware of those arguments um, 
so let's try, let me make another point, which is, uh, which is now uh, a more experimental point about uh, um, trying to understand uh, um, the dimensionality of behavior. Um, the, we often think about behavior in terms of Markov models and things like this. And so if you have uh, correlations in behavior that extend over very long times, that's the kind of thing that could generate, that could be a sign of large numbers of hidden states or something that's really intrinsically high dimensional. And it's important to realize that it's very hard um, to uh, actually measure these things. Um, so what I've done here is to give you a couple of examples. Um, so suppose, for instance, that what was really going on was that you were observing a single variable and it had exponentially decaying correlations. Uh, but slowly, right, because this is behavior. So maybe the correlations extend over half a minute or so. Now, in order to compute correlations, you have to subtract the mean. But what mean do you subtract? So, what, so normally, you think about situations in which you have very large data sets. And so the mean is somehow the mean, and it's all OK. But if you're watching animal behavior, you know, maybe the correlations extend over, over a minute and you get to watch the behavior for an hour. So if you're lucky, you have a few tens of independent samples of the behavior. The square root of a few tens tells you that you actually don't know the mean um, uh, to within 30% or so. So subtracting off the mean is actually complicated. And if you try subtracting off, so now conceptually, if you imagine that you, that you try to subtract off the mean, um, so in, the, in these simulations, we imagine that you've recorded for an hour. And if you try to subtract off the mean by taking the mean over that hour, then you will actually distort the correlations, um, right? Remember, if you actually subtract the mean over time, then that means that, that at, at the longest possible time difference, there are, there are actually, you know, the, so the, the integral of the thing you're measuring doesn't fluctuate because the mean is the integral, right? That's what you've defined uh, the mean to be. And so if you do the standard thing of subtracting off uh, the, the mean over time, you distort the correlations by making them, by reducing them at longer times. And in fact, they'll go negative so that plotting them on a, on a semi-log plot doesn't work. On the other hand, you could say, well, wait a second. Um, whenever I do animal behavior, I look at lots of animals. So you could um, instead compute a mean across, uh, across the animals or alternatively across the trials um, from any single animal. But if you imagine that the differences among the animals or among the trials contribute 1% to the total behavioral variance, which is actually quite small for individual differences, then it turns out that what you're doing is distorting the correlation function um, in the opposite direction. Um, the 1% is sitting here. And so what you see is that actually even recovering exponentially decaying correlations on the scale of half a minute is not so easy to do in a behavioral experiment. The situation is much worse if the correlations actually had a power law behavior. Of course, they can't have power law behavior to arbitrarily short times. So if you make some simple form of the correlation function so that it looks like this and asymptotically becomes a power law, um, here's the, the true power law is the dashed line, then um, again, you have these problems that if you, if you define the mean to be the mean over time in single for a single organism over the hour long uh, uh, hour of behavior, then you underestimate the correlation function. If you try to average over many organisms that have very small individual differences, then you distort the correlation function the other way. And suddenly you sort of wonder, where did, where did my nice power law go? And let me emphasize that these are calculations being done in the infinite data limit, right? So there are no error bars here because you imagine that you just measure everything perfectly. Um, and you can see that that trying to the fact that your behavioral uh, data lasts of order an hour and correlations are supposed to be uh, order um, order minutes or order minute um, uh, creates lots of problems. And just as an interesting side note, um, if there are small individual differences, uh, sorry, if if you have 
um, long range correlations in time, then that means that you never quite get to the point, you never really get to the point where your samples are independent of each other. They're always weakly dependent um, at longer and longer times. And if you take this example of power law correlations um, and you shuffle the data in time, which is sort of the gold standard for what the smallest, for checking whether you have a problem with finite data size, you discover that you will measure uh, an information level, which is this. And again, um, uh, there's no error bar here because this is a, this is the average value you will get if you do that shuffling. You, again, you record for an hour. Um, and you'll notice that the true information actually dips below this. So this is wonderful because it shows you that in the presence of long range correlations in time, uh, your standard thought that you should shuffle data doesn't actually give you zero um, for the mutual information. Uh, and in fact, you can meaningfully measure mutual information which are smaller than what you get by shuffling. And again, we could talk about how this happens. Um, so these are all um, these are all little mathematical exercises. Um, the point of which is that that trying to get at the behavior um, of behavioral correlations when they it, when they have the possibility of lasting for very long times um, is actually pretty challenging. So what can you do? Um, one of the things you can try and do is to compress your description of the behavioral state at any one moment in time in the hopes that um, that you can still capture the correlations that extend over longer times. Um, and uh, um, when Gordon Berman was in Princeton, uh, we worked with uh, Josh Shavitz and, and Dan Choi in the beginning um, to try and uh, do something like this uh, in, in the case of flies that are walking around in relatively featureless environments. And what we found was that walking flies visit about 100 stereotyped behavioral states. But that causes a problem because you now want to talk about correlations in time. You know, wandering through a hundred dimensional state space is pretty hard to handle. Um, so what we did was to ask how would you um, how would you uh, uh, compress your description of the behavioral state at each moment in time through some probability distribution? Um, and the goal would be to to preserve to compress as much as possible um, and preserve the information that is the mutual information between the, the compressed variables at successive times. Uh, uh, again, at, determined by the, by the frame rate here, which was, which was 100 hertz. Um, the 100 states that we started with are sitting here. They're categorized um, by hand here. Uh, sorry, the, the, the real boundaries are automatic, but then the description that these are wing movements is, is, is humans. Um, when you do the compression all the way down to two states, um, you get this, which is interesting. It's not just moving and not moving, which you might have guessed. Um, it's more subtle than that. And happily, um, this two-state uh, description actually has long-range correlations. So even if you watch after a thousand behavioral transitions, you still see that which of the two states you're in um, is you're correlated. And just to be clear, with these two states, right, there, there is um, a natural Markov description where you just keep track of the rate at which you jump from one state to the other on average. And that Markov model would, of course, predict that the correlations decay much more rapidly, and in particular, decay exponentially. So you could ask, well, having turned my description of behavior into just a, a binary sequence of these two states, can I write down a model of that, um, of that sequence, of that binary sequence? And the simplest model you can write down um, is one that matches um, the average probability of being in the two states. Um, so here you can take sigma to be plus and minus one for the two states. And you match the correlations by allowing the, um, the variables at the two different times to interact with each other with some strength j of tau. Um, many of you will recognize that this is the maximum entropy model, um, which means that it has the least structure that's consistent with this correlation function and the, um, and the mean occupancy of these two different states. Um, so what happens when you do that? Well, the striking thing is that if you try to match the correlations, um, when I tell you to match the correlations, you have to ask how far out to go. If you only go out to 100 transitions, you get the red curve. If you go out to a few hundred transitions, you get the uh, green curve. And if you go out as far as the data allow, you get the blue points with error bars. 
And what you see is that the further and further out you go, you keep revealing longer and longer interactions um, uh, that extend over longer and longer times. And in fact, they have a very simple form that's almost itself kind of scale invariant, goes as one over the number of transitions squared. Um, and if you ask yourself, well, okay, that's nice, but you know, how do we know that this model's right? Um, what this model predicts is that if you tell me what the state, what the behavioral state was at all the other times, I can tell you what is the probability that the behavioral state will be either zero or one or plus or minus one at any single time just by computing um, this quantity, which now has no free parameters because you determined what J is. In fact, to do this computation, we simplified and said, let's assume that J really is one over tau squared with the, with the coefficient A uh, fixed uh, to the amplitude that you measure here. And then what you find um, is that if you walk through the data and find every moment where this effective field has a particular value, and you ask, well, what fraction of the time am I in the plus one state? What fraction of the time am I in the minus one state? Average them together, um, you find that the data fall perfectly on the hyperbolic tangent curve, a little bit off at the, at the extremes. So what this tells you is that you're seeing measurable, nearly scale invariant interactions over hundreds, maybe maybe a thousand um, behavioral state transitions. Um, so what do you take away from all this? Um, I think uh, you should be a little worried about dimensionality reduction. Obviously, we have to do some dimensionality reduction in order to, um, in order to make sense out of things. Um, but I think that we should be on the lookout for situations where, in fact, what we're able to observe gives us a window into very large numbers of hidden states, which are somehow organized in interesting ways. And I've, har I've sort of harped on the theme of scale invariance, um, which is one way in which this could happen. It's a way that um, because of our experience in the physics literature, we find that it's, it, it has an appeal to it. I don't think it's the only one, um, but in some way I find the idea that, uh, you know, if I watch the behavior of a fly walking around, that somehow by looking at the complexity of the sequence of states that it wanders through, I have a window into some very large number of hidden internal states um, in, inside the fly's brain. I find that to be very appealing. Um, and the idea that they would be organized in this very special way um, so as to generate essentially scale invariant um, memory across these hundreds of transitions um, is quite striking. So um, this is an appeal to think carefully about the ideas of dimensionality reduction, um, to search for alternatives, to articulate more alternatives. Um, and if you really think that the system you're looking at um, exhibits strong evidence of dimensionality reduction, um, to then ask not, uh, not to sort of satisfy yourself that that happens, but to search for theoretical reasons why it should be true. So let me stop there. It gives a few minutes to answer some questions. Uh, and of course, we'll come back this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so yes, we do have a few questions and, and people have asked uh, you know, some questions in the, the chat, which I think you, you tried to answer, but we're gonna go to the questions um, here. I'll just remind people uh, before we get started with the question and answer period, uh, that there is another period in uh, five hours from now, so to two o'clock Eastern, but wherever you are, uh, come back in five hours. Uh, and I, I think there's enough time so that people can actually have sort of a dialogue if, if, if there is time to call people up and, and actually talk with Bill, um, you know, we'll try to do that. But but there is one question here that's got a number of votes. I'm gonna pose that um, uh, right now. So in the standard icing model, you average over units that are close to each other and don't have long distance correlations. For neurons, is as if we have an icing model with all to all interactions and then choose pairs of units that have the strongest correlation. Is that like putting neurons that have strong correlations close to each other? In the CA1 linear track case, you can imagine putting place cells in order uh, and have only limited interactions. Would that work in other cases? Okay, so this is a great question. Let me, let me make a couple of points. So one is in the standardizing model, um, what, you, what you don't have are long distance interactions. You can have long distance correlations but you don't have long distance interactions. The, the correlations propagate through the system. And indeed at the critical point, they propagate essentially infinitely far. Um, 
if you tried the argument that we're doing, so so that's let's answer to sort of part one of it. The next part is could you can you think of this as putting the neurons in some space where they're next to each other um, if they have strong correlations? Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. We haven't done that. That was actually first suggested to me by Marcelo Magnasco, um, who pointed out that you know that is what multidimensional scaling is, right? Is you you put thing you try to embed things in a space such that distance in the space embodies their correlations, um, and then you could ask whether it's the same thing, whether our procedure of coarse graining based on correlations is then the same as really coarse graining by distance in that synthetic space. Um, it is sure, so I think that's a really interesting question and I just don't know the answer. Um, the question of whether you could implement that in, in the particular data set we're looking at by um, using uh, position in the real space of the experiment, um, that's not going to work because only a fraction of the neurons are actually place cells in this region. Um, and in fact, if you choose only the place cells for your analysis, you don't see the scaling behaviors um, that we see. It's really a property of the network as a whole. So, um, so I think the open question is about um, what happens for the uh, in this sort of is there an embedding? Um, which takes our procedure and, and makes it turns it back into a real space procedure. So there is a follow up, and I'll just pose it just to make sure that that it, it's been addressed. Um, are there theoretical guarantees regarding the coarse graining of all to all interaction icing models? So, um, so let me interpret this as just a statistical mechanics question, right? So this is not about neurons. Um, so you can do, for example. Um, uh, you can do the normalization group analysis, for instance, for models that have uh, long-range interactions. Uh, all to all is a little bit weird, um, but um, but you can do it. Uh, but in particular, you can do the case of long-range interactions and classify things and so on, and uh, so that all works. So locality, but it is still true, right, that when you say long-range interactions, you usually mean that the strength of the interaction is a function is a decreasing function of distance. And so uh, that still means that that it's natural to uh, to coarse grain in real space. Great, thank you. Um, I, there's a couple of other questions here right now, but I think what we'll do is is we're going to stop and roll these questions forward to the the question and answer period um, this afternoon. Uh, and and I would remind people that. Um, you, you can watch the, the video again, it's, it's recorded, uh, and go to the Crowdcast site to ask questions. You can ask questions anytime between now and, and the question period, and all those questions will be accumulated uh, and, and kept for that, that period. So, so please come back if you'd actually like to, to talk with, with Bill and get you know, sort of a dialogue going. Otherwise, I will see you this afternoon, and the next um, session starts, I think, at 9.20, which is a little bit of break. Uh, for everyone. So thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Professor Bialik, for a great uh, talk, very uh, sort of thought provoking, I think, in many directions. Um, and, and so with that, uh, have, a, have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much. I look forward to seeing you in the afternoon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.